holy and all wise Father. Yeah. It's once more and again that your children have gathered around your throne of grace to have you speak to our hearts and our minds. It's once more and again, Lord God, that we have allowed the songs that were sung, the scriptures that have been raised, and the praises that have gone up to break up the fallow ground of our heart. So that when the seed of your word is planted, it will take root inside of us and strengthen us, Lord God, so that we can grow into the people you have called us to be. In faith, Lord God, I sit down. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming in and doing what only you can do. I love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, my soul says amen. 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 I need everyone to have paper and pencil today. Paper and pencil. And I need you to turn back in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter. We're only going to read two verses. When everyone has paper and pencil, uh, your cell phone should be off. No one should have their cell phones in their hand, unless, of course, they have their Bibles on there. And if you have your Bible on there, then that's fine. Amen. John 20, we're going to look at verses 24 through 25, and it reads, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. This text is familiar to most of us who have been in the faith for any length of time. And we commonly refer to it as the story of Doubting Thomas. The most people that I've heard that have done sermons on this man called Thomas have criticized him, have ridiculed him, and some have even slandered his name. And I would dare say that most people who are so harsh on Thomas feels that way about him because they see so much of themselves Amen. inside of this Amen. man. Because if all of us or any of us in here this morning were truly honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that we have doubted God at times. Amen. If we are uh, honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that when there were certain situations that came up in our life and the answers didn't come when or how we wanted them to, we would question and say, where was God when this situation happened in my life? And we would start to doubt. Some people here, oh, and maybe some people on, in TV land or wherever, they may have asked that question or felt that way when the body of Felicia Barnes was found. I'm sure some of them said, where was God when this child was taken in whatever manner she was? I'm sure the family of Katrina's co-worker asked the same question this week when her 33-year-old co-worker had a heart attack while she was in surgery in the hospital and died, <coughs> leaving three young children without a mom. I'm sure they asked, where was God? Why, why did God allow this to happen? And then the doubt comes in. I'm sure the, the family of Kim Hurdle's co-worker whose son died this week also in the hospital after he had been there for a while and developed pneumonia and then uh, things turned worse and, and he died. And I, I know that all of these people in these instances that I just gave you had to have asked themselves the question, God is a good God. I believe he is a good God. So why was he not here when I needed him the most? Now, this can be referred to as a hard question. And some of you may have asked yourself hard questions at that time, at some time. You may have said, where was God when I was fired from my job? Or where was God when my husband left me or, or my wife left 
me? And where was God when I got sick? Where was God when this happened and that happened? And some people say that since we are people of faith, that we should never ask those kind of questions of God. But my brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to know that you can ask God the hard questions. I want you to remember the scripture where scripture says there is nothing too hard for God. So if there is nothing that is too hard for God, there is no question that is too hard for God. The answer to where was God when all of these horrific things happened? The answer to where was God when this happened in my life or that happened in my life? The answer is very simple. The answer is not something that takes a rocket science. The answer is that God was right there all the time, loving you through it all. I want you to know that he was right there with Felicia Barnes and with the girl in the hospital and the woman that lost her son. I want you to know that he was right there hurting right along with them. Because my brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to understand that the God that we serve knows what it feel, feels like to lose someone that you love. I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters of Christ, that the God that we serve knows what it feels like to see someone that they love hurt and abused. I want you to understand that the God that we serve knows what it feels like to have a child die. So yes, the answer to the question as to where was God when these things happened, is that he was there all of the time. But then there's the other side to that question. If you say, okay, Pasha, I believe that God was there, then why did God allow these things to happen? Now, I cannot give you a, 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 a succinct answer for that. I cannot give you an exact answer for that because with our limited understanding of God and the ways of God, it is hard for us to understand why he allows certain things to happen. But I want you to know that you don't have to back off from asking God these questions because God already knows that you have them in your heart. Amen. What he does not want you to do is allow those questions to cause you to start doubting and not believing in him. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Look at Thomas for a moment. Thomas knew that Jesus had been arrested by the soldiers and the religious leaders. He was right there. Thomas knew that Jesus had been sentenced to death. He knew that Jesus had died an excruciating death on the cross, and he knew that Jesus was buried in a grave. Now, I'm sure that Thomas asked some of the same questions that many of you have asked when things have, have happened in your life. I'm sure that Thomas asked the question, why did God allow this to happen to Jesus? I'm sure that Thomas said he was a good man. Why wouldn't God have prevented him from going through all the things that he went through? So Thomas asked the same questions that many of us ask, but we try to be so spiritual. We pretend that we never ask these kind of questions, and we try to act like doubt never comes into our mind. We look at doubting Thomas, we condemn him, but if we are honest with ourselves, we have got to say at some point in time when we are praying, we have not been able to pray in faith that we have been doubting the whole time we were praying whether God was going to do what we asked at all. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to look at Thomas just for a minute. And I want you to actually see him. I want you to understand what he had gone through. And I want you to try and put yourself in his place when the disciples came to him and told him that Jesus was alive. I want you to imagine that it was you. I want you to imagine that you were there with Jesus in the garden when he was arrested. I want you to imagine that you stood on the periphery of the crowd while Jesus was hanging on that cross. I want you to imagine as you saw Jesus being taken down and put in a grave. I want you to imagine that you were there and then that three days later 
somebody came to you and said, you know that man Jesus? He's alive. What would have been your reaction? You would have doubted just like Thomas doubted. Don't you understand? You probably would have had, and I probably would have had, the same exact, uh, um, uh, uh, thank you Jesus, same exact reaction that Thomas did. But I want you to notice, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that Jesus did not condemn Thomas Amen. for his uh, doubting. Amen. I want you to notice that Jesus did not condemn him. He did not reprimand him. What did Jesus do? He gently led Thomas from doubt to faith. He led him from doubt to faith. For he said one moment, unless I put my hands in his side and see the nail prints in his hand, I'm not going to believe. And the next moment he's saying, my Lord and my God. Jesus led him from doubt to faith. There's some of you in here this morning, and I know that this sermon was prepared for some particular people. I know Amen. that. Amen. And there's some of you in here who are struggling with doubt, but because you're trying to act you're like you're stronger than you are, then you're not admitting to it. But God said to tell you this morning that the point of this me message is to lead you from doubt to faith. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And God said to tell you that the re way that he's going to lead you this morning from doubt to faith is that he is going to give you seven confessions. Mm. You say, Pastor, what, I'm what are you talking about? I'm telling you that God has told me to give you seven scriptures that he wants you to take and commit to memory. And he says, as you commit these scriptures to memory, it is going to make you stronger in your faith and it's going to take you from the land of doubt to the land of faith. He wants you to understand that you don't have to be condemned because sometimes you doubt or you don't believe or have as much faith. But he says, don't worry about the fact that you doubt, just don't make your home there. Amen. He doesn't want you to build a house and live in the land of doubt. He wants to take you from the land of doubt to the land of faith. And the way that he's going to do it is through these seven confessions. Now, of course, we all in here know that seven is the number of completion. So God said if we can get these seven scriptures in our heart and in our mind, it's going to revolutionize our life. And once he's given us these scriptures, he says what he wants us to do is to start confessing them out of our mouth. Because he says if you stop speaking doubt and lack of faith that you will be able to allow the seed of faith uh, yeah, the seed of faith to grow in your life. Amen. Most people are where they are now is because all they do is speak out of their mouth doubt and unbelief and this kind of thing and God says as long as you're confessing nothing but unbelief that's exactly what you're going to have. Amen? Amen. So God says when doubt starts to take root inside of you the first thing he wants you to do is to turn to Jeremiah 33, 3. This is why I told you I want everyone to have paper and pencil. I'm so sorry that so many people will be missing this today. But God knows if you take these seven scriptures that God is going to give you today, it's going to revolutionize your life. Jeremiah 33, 3. When you have it, speak to me, Lord. Speak to me, Lord. Amen? Right. I didn't hear but one person. Okay, you have it. You gotta see it. If you don't see it, remember, faith comes by hearing, right? And then we've got to be able to see it in faith. You need to be able to see this. Jeremiah 33, 3. Amen? Amen. First of all, I need to let you know that I've told you this before, but this is God's phone number. If you ever want to call God up, Turn to Jeremiah 33.3. How do I know that's his phone number? What does it say? Call to me and I answer you. Amen. This is God's telephone number. Turn to Jeremiah 33.3 and it says, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. God is saying to you this morning that you may not understand what is going on in your life. But one thing that you have got to
to know. You've got to know that you know the one who understands exactly what is going on and why he is allowing what is going on to go on in your life. Amen. He says, call on me. God says, I want you to stop feeling like you don't, you cannot ask me the hard questions. Stop pussyfooting around me. If you got a question, if you got a complaint, then come on, let's talk about it. Call me. Call me. I'm, I'm talk. He says, I answer you. He says, I'm not going to put you on an answering machine or I'm not going to scream like your calls or whatever. He says, if you call me, I will answer you. But he says, I will not only answer you, but I'm going to show you great and mighty things that I'm going to do in your life. If you call on me, I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that I'm going to do in your life. But he says, I will show you great and mighty things that I'm going to do through you. Amen. When doubt comes in, Hallelujah. call on the Lord. Call the Lord. When you start feeling like your faith is weak, Amen. call on the Lord. Amen. Don't call me up. Don't call Sally Sue up. Call on the Lord. When you feel like you don't understand why and you just feel like you're drifting away from God, Amen. God says what you need to do is call him up. Amen. And he promises that he will answer and he will answer the hard questions that you have for him. Amen. After you've done that and you see different things going on in your life and you're about ready to pull your hair out and every time you turn around you're just getting bad news here or bad news there, I need you to turn to Exodus 14, 14. This is the next thing that God says he wants you to do. The first thing he wants you to do is call on him. Okay? He wants you to come to him and tell him what's going on inside of you. He wants you to come to him and allow him to minister to you and let you know, okay, yes, you may be going through some hard times. Yes, you may be doubting, but if you allow me, I will take you from doubt to faith. The next thing you got to learn to do is in Exodus 14, 14. You have it? It says... This one you got to want. Everybody yeah. should see. I don't know where my teenagers went, but they Amen. need to see this. The Lord will fight for you Amen. while you keep silent. Amen. The Lord will fight for you while you keep your mouth shut. The Lord will fight for you while you keep your... God said, what are your problems? One of the reasons you're in the situation that you're in, the one of the reasons ever is because you don't know how to keep your mouth shut. All you do is run off in the mouth. You have diarrhea of the mouth. You just keep going and going and going. You don't know when to shut up. You don't know when to stop. Amen. Amen. God says, I will fight your battles. But you've got to learn how to keep quiet. God says, one of the problems that you, reason you have so many problems in your life is because all you do is run off at your mouth about what's going on in your life. Not praying. Not praying. Just running off at your mouth. Always what's going on. He says, all you're doing is giving Satan more ammunition than power attack. Amen. He said, we give him too much information. Keep your mouth shut. You don't need to be talking about everything that is going on in your life all the time. Keep your mouth shut. I'm not taking to God. Didn't he say call me first? He said call me first. I'll answer. He said, but what I need you to do is first of one way is why I'm answering it while I'm talking to you. You keep quiet. Because a whole time, a whole lot of times while I'm trying to talk to you and explain things to you, you're constantly complaining in my ear. You cannot even hear what I gotta say because you're running off at the mouth. Amen. Do you understand? Amen. It says the Lord will fight for you when you keep silent. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I wish this was last Sunday. We had all these people here. <laughs> and then, Amen. But you are, you have to understand that uh thank you, Lord Jesus, that God says if he will fight for us when we learn how to hold our peace. Amen. 